Welcome to the podcast series on GBV Learning Impact, funded by the Safe from the Start Project. I am your host, Liloba Paul, Senior Learning and Development Officer on topics related to gender-based violence. This work is a collaboration between the UNHCR Division of International Protection, the Regional Bureaus, and the Division of Human Resources, Global Learning and Development Center in Budapest. It is my pleasure to have with me today Michelle Fong, Assistant Protection Officer on Child Protection and Gender-Based Violence. Thank you for joining me from Malaysia. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and how long you've been with UNHCR? How did you get started? And perhaps um, a little bit about what you're covering in your current role. I've been working with UNHCR Malaysia for 15 years now. Um, I started out as a volunteer carrying out preliminary child protection assessments for unaccompanied children, primarily from Myanmar and Afghanistan at the time. And then I went on to do a lot of best interest determination and best interest procedures. And later, uh, this led me on to lead both the GBV and Child Protection Department in Malaysia. Um, There was a restructuring exercise a few years ago, and my role now as a national officer focuses on overseeing the implementation of child protection and GPV programming in Malaysia. And my role, uh, you know, encompasses advocating with relevant stakeholders to improve refugee inclusion, uh, namely for refugee women and girls. And I guess what can I say? It's, It's been a great and rewarding journey so far. Yes, and that's quite a significant time, 15 years in the operation. What -hmm. kind of situation are you working in in Malaysia? Well, Malaysia is an urban refugee operation hosting around 185,000 registered refugees from more than 50 uh, different uh, different nationalities. Uh, Malaysia is a non-signatory country to the Refugee Convention, and, and, and refugees, unfortunately, do not have legal status, um, have no access to formal education, work rights, and affordable health care. Um, we have partners, but they are scattered across the country. Um, they also have varying levels of capacity, but generally very limited resources to deliver targeted programs effectively or at the scale necessary. So while we're host to one of the largest numbers of refugees in the region, we have a very small uh, urban urban operation with a modest budget. Um, And we have quite a number of initiatives. We think we we can still show quite a lot of good good practices around. Yes, and that is what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about GBV learning impact and to follow the results chain here. So which example of GBV learning with the Global Learning and Development Center would you like to highlight? So maybe before I jump into that, I'd like to kind of maybe paint a little bit of a background. So um, there's been quite a lot of, uh, quite a few enabling factors behind some of the outcomes we are seeing today. In 2019, UNHCR, with the support of the the Global Learning Development Center, uh, carried out a GB risk mitigation workshop. Initially, Loba, you were part of that. And uh, together, we developed a national action plan on GBV risk mitigation. Um, And this was a pivotal moment for the operation. Uh, The exercise involved UNHCR, its various sections, um, NGO partners, and several refugee groups. And it was through this consultation or this process, we recognized that addressing GBV effectively really requires collective commitment and collaboration across uh, different sectors. Um, And so we were presented with the opportunity to review, um, you know, quite a number of gaps jointly with uh, the other uh, participants and and led the operation to concertedly strengthen our internal GBV mainstreaming efforts um, and externally through expanding community outreach and engagement by diversifying partnerships. Well, thanks for explaining those connections. And moving with the results chain, what actions did you take as a result of the learning intervention? So before, uh, maybe recently, a recent restructuring exercise, um, I was heading the Child Protection and GBV department. And in my capacity, um, I made it a priority for us to ensure that adequate resources were made available to promote women's leadership and participation uh, through safe space 
programming as GBV risk mitigation as a risk mitigation strategy. Um, I mean, we we see also intersections with child protection um, and 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 you know other forms of um, violence as well. So we, we thought this yes. was quite important. In parallel, um, UNHCR was also part of um, an action research project in collaboration with the University of New South Wales. Um, um, we also partnered with a local university through this initiative, NGO partners and refugee-led groups to study barriers faced by refugee women in Malaysia and how to address GBV in line with the Global Compact on Refugees. So it was through this um, sort of initial phases of consultation with refugee communities, it was made apparent to UNHCR um, by refugee groups that, that there was a trust deficit and, and because um, they, they could not contact UNHCR. Uh, they were presented with inconsistent information by different maybe personnel of UNHCR, and they faced tremendous challenges in accessing timely response services, including even when they are experiencing GBV. So, you know, we found this exercise to be uh, an in, a valuable reminder to UNHCR about our privilege and power and how we needed to do better in, in establishing two-way communication channels and making it as accessible as possible and safe for refugee women and girls to participate in planning and implementation, um, as well as be able to share feedback on, you know, quality of GBV services out there. Um, and also, you know, based on which jointly advocate with the government to improve accessibility towards national um, protection mechanisms. And such, we made pledges to the refugee women in this project, as well as other community engagements that UNHCR will make stronger efforts to prioritize women and girls and to include refugee women in the planning and decision-making process. And this level of inclusion had never been done before. So, you know, we were very proud of, of, of that pivotal moment. Um, and, and, you know, we had to shift our approaches um, and this was an important step towards rebuilding trust and empowering refugee women and girls. And if I may add as well, is, is that it's also important to point out that we also had to reflect and, and stop taking on this savior complex, if you will, and, and recognize that we had to do this with other, with other actors and, and share what we know or don't know and be transparent with the expertise we had, share our resources um, and work with, with other actors that also work with refugees. Um, and in recognizing that we each have different roles to play in addressing refugee protection and empowering communities to address GBV. You definitely make a clear case here for the partnerships that were key in moving this entire initiative forward. And it sounds like there are several initiatives that are intertwined as well. How have you been able to sustain this? Um, so I have to give credit and, and, and highlight that the support and that leadership of our representative and senior management was crucial for us to be able to allocate enough resources and prioritize programming for women and girls. And, and I think in parallel, some of our engagements with refugee women-led organizations also received generous support from the Australian government and along with UNHCR's contribution to uh, the Women and Girls at Risk project, which is uh, the way we, we call it here in Malaysia is the WAGA project, we could stretch our programming for five years. And this multi-year support has been so meaningful to increasing the number of refugee women assisted, um, increasing the number of refugee women-led groups and leaders, um, and also sustaining our engagement as well as achievements that we've seen in this project. Having access to funding like that is a significant source of stability. Yeah, I mean, of course. And I think at least two and a half years, um, UNHCR was able to channel funding to ensure refugee women and girls could safely meet, even during the COVID-19 lockdown. And these regular meetings for refugee women meant so much to them, um, especially those who were trapped at home. And at least they were able to discuss and share information around services, assistance, training and, and also emotionally support one another. This group of, of refugee women were also well supported by UNHCR, NGO partners, academia, and, and we now see them contributing back towards strengthening other refugee women and girls to participate, uh, mentor new leaders, and design community-based solutions that fit their needs. 
In addition, UNHCR provided training on GBV, case management, um, and other protection topics, uh, facilitated linkages to service providers. Other partners also contributed funding for livelihoods programs, psychological first aid training, and leadership training, technical support on referrals to appropriate services. Uh, and, and so we, we cannot take full credit uh, for the positive results and outcomes that we have seen come through this program. Uh, this initiative is, is really a testament to the effectiveness of the reciprocal approach. Um, and this consultative and joint approach has benefited more than 1,500 refugee women from nine different refugee groups. Um, and, and it's through the Women's Safe Space programming, the psychosocial support, livelihoods programs, and, and also direct GBV services. In your description, you mentioned several enabling factors, the strong support from management, resource mobilization and multi-year funding, and also the relationship that was developed with the community. Can you elaborate on those and how they helped shape the results of your efforts? So yeah, um, in 2019, our our office, our, our operation had so many different technical units. So it's like health, um, uh, education, child protection, and, and just many, many different technical units. And, and we were just not built to implement the uh, you know, multi-sectoral protection strategy we had. So what do we have to do? I mean, or, or how do we do this? Well, we had a very brief rep a representative who consulted various colleagues and executed a comprehensive restructuring exercise, really flipping the office around uh, to ensure that the operation had the right staffing and infrastructure to engage with different stakeholders, namely refugees, effectively. So we now have a much bigger community-based protection department, a policy and advocacy sort of department to, to advance advocacy efforts. Um, and the community-based protection department is dedicated to improving communication with communities, um, monitor and reach out to refugee communities across the country and build the capacity of grassroots communities. So, yeah, I mean, having senior management buy-in is critical. Um, it was been an a, a important enabling factor and they played a pivotal role in resource mobilization uh, and bringing all sectors together to prioritize GBV within their respective areas of work. Um, another enabling factor was the multi-year funding uh, that we got from donors uh, for working with refugee women-led groups. Um, the government's flexibility on how we carried out the work encouraged innovation, and it has shown to be so meaningful to increasing the number of refugee women-led assisted, um, I'm sorry, women assisted, um, increasing num the number of refugee women-led groups and leaders, and sustain our engagements as well as, the, as achievements. So it sounds like there were many outcomes that resulted from these changes that happened in your operation. What impact did you see on the lives of people forced to flee? So I think one of the biggest impacts uh, we see now after five years um, since we began this initiative or the restructuring and, and the redesigned uh, approach is that there is now significantly more women in leadership and we regularly engage with more than 32 refugee women and girls from more than nine different nationalities in co-designing solutions with UNHCR and partners. And a testament to that is, is that in November last year, the refugee women and girls organized their own expo um, and hundreds of people came uh, and it was called the Empowering Refugee Women Expo. And they took the opportunity to highlight their journeys, uh, their achievements, and how they managed you know, different projects within their respective refugee groups um, and, and how they addressed the needs of women in their communities and built connections with donors and partners as well. Um, that's one. Another is, you know, we see an increased uh, in GBV awareness um, and access to GBV services as well. Um, and from our increased coordination and time spent with other actors in this, uh, in this sort of uh, platform uh, or sphere is that we see also a, a shared um, strengthening of technical capacities uh, and to provide, uh, or at least the shared sort of ambition to provide quality services in line with minimum standards. 
we, I mean, the other kind of impact we saw um, in terms of, you know, linking between the, the national protection system and access for refugees is that we see increased engagement with government and the wider humanitarian network. We have a more consistent approach to lobbying with government and, and we see some improvement into accessibility to protection uh, and response services by the national authorities. And we also see more avenues to dialogue, to navigate negative public sentiments as well. So we see quite a bit of positive impact through this initiative and, and this approach. Yes, thanks for outlining those points of impact. And there's a lot of strength in that work that was done by so many actors coming together. What were some of the challenges you faced? Uh, there's been lots of challenges. Um, so while there has been quite a few you know, positive steps forward, uh, the protection needs continue to grow. Uh, and there is a, an, an increased funding gap. Uh, funding is, is, I know, something that we are all struggling with. Um, and, and, but you know, we, do, we do need funding to be able to sustain some of these community-based programs. Um, and, and also to strengthen our government engagements to improve conditions for refugees in the country. Uh, so regrettably, um, in 2024, uh, UNHCR could no longer continue funding the Women and Girls Safe Space Project due to the significant budget uh, constraints. We had to prioritize life-saving interventions um, due to this, and, and this also severely impacts maybe the geographical reach and scale-up that we were looking at doing through this initiative. But um, yeah, I mean, we remain hopeful and then we're committed to, to still, you know, soldier on. Yeah, I think our listeners definitely can relate to those experiences that you're having as well. What impact did the GBV learning intervention have on you? Yeah, so personally, I've learned so much um, from this, you know, this past five years, I, I've learned so much about privilege and power. Uh, I have to honestly say that I've underestimated the capacity of refugee women and girls. And, and, and now I see how resilient they are and how much of an expert they are in their own situations of forced displacement and, and how much they can also do um, when they are given the right kind of environment and, and support systems to, to lead and, and design uh, solutions for themselves. And so what I've been able to see the past few years is, is how um, ensuring trauma-informed approaches and making sure that refugee women receive emotional support really does enable them to participate and lead. Um, and in a recent meeting, you know, uh, with, with, with these refugee women, you can see, you know, some of them are mothers, they brought their babies along. And, and when one woman, you know, wished to speak, another woman from another nationality would just swoop in and carry her baby without any hesitation and it's it's really an amazing thing to see um, how these women come together and and how they shine uh, through this this entire journey so yeah I see equal partnership and shared responsibility um, truly does promote gender equality and and community-based protection what do you see as a way to create a lasting impact from GBV learning that's more sustainable? For example, when funding is greatly reduced or after UNHCR even has to close down offices? Yeah, so we're very thankful um, that our engagement with the refugee women and girls in the last five years, um, you know, did receive this consistent multi-year support um, to the refugee groups. And, and this not only promoted trust, uh, it also improved, um, you know, knowledge sharing and shared understanding um, and also contributed significantly to strong foundations um, and, and the capacity to respond to the needs at home and in their community. And these refugee uh, women who were empowered can now go on to empower others and uh, inspire the host community that they, they live amongst to, to recognize that they are resilient and that refugees can make a significant contribution to the countries that they are seeking asylum in, and also in third countries. Um, we are confident in the lasting impact of our work with the refugee women and girls in this project. There is so much room for scale up 
uh, and the ripple effects will, I think, will continue to 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 go on um, in other groups of women across the country and region, even with that that funding reduction. And thank you, Michelle, for your time with us today. Thank you for speaking about privilege and power and also for sharing your experiences on the impact GBV Learning had on you, your operation, and also your work today. Thank you, too, and um, very welcome. It was nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. To all of our listeners, do tune in to the next podcast in our series from the GLDC on GBV Learning Impact in UNHCR.